Minister. Well, business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12266 in the name of Mary Fee on an unfair sentence. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would also invite those members who are leaving the chamber and indeed the members of the public who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly. Mary Fee, I now call on you seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to move this motion for members' debate to discuss the report by the NSPCC and Bernardo's An Unfair Sentence, a spotlight on babies in the criminal justice system. The report highlights the issue of babies and parental imprisonment, providing an evidence review about how babies are affected by imprisonment, what services are effective and how practice can be improved. Pregnancy and the first year of a baby's life are an important time in giving a child a healthy start. Mothers need support and care during pregnancy, and once born, babies need a safe and stimulating environment and a healthy early relationship with their caregivers. Not receiving these will lead to adverse effects on the baby's physical, social and emotional development. There has been no empirical study of the effect of imprisonment on infants in the UK, and the knowledge currently available is based on psychological theory. The report goes on to detail mental health problems for women in prison and their children. It finds that women in prison are five times more likely to have mental health problems than women in the general population. It also finds that children of prisoners have at least twice as high a risk of developing mental health problems as their peers and three times as high a risk of exhibiting antisocial or delinquent behaviour. This can result in intergenerational offending, where it has been estimated that 65% of boys with a parent in prison will likely go on to offend. The negative effects of parental imprisonment have clearly been identified in infant development and future prospects. However, it is difficult to begin to help this vulnerable group when we do not have exact figures. Estimates show there are between 20 and 27,000 children under the age of 18 affected by parental imprisonment in Scotland. Using these estimates and assuming that the age distribution of children with parents in prison is the same as children in the general population, the NSPCC estimate that between 3,400 and 4,600 infants under three are affected. There is currently no systematic approach to quantifying how many babies have a parent in prison. But in the Scottish Prison Service 13th Prisoner Survey, almost two-thirds of female prisoners, which is 65%, and half of male prisoners, 52%, reported having children. The report goes on to specify some examples of interventions delivered in prison that are beginning to emerge. However, the success of these schemes to date tends to be judged more on the outcomes for the parent than the infant. These intervention programmes are being delivered by a range of third sector organisations, including Family Action, the Prison Advice and Care Trust, Mellow Parenting, the NSPCC and the Aberlour Child Care Trust. However, these interventions are not centrally organised and it seems to be down to luck whether mothers of infants are able to participate. The NSPCC and Bernardo's report highlights six key recommendations on how to improve outcomes. The Scottish Government should formally identify infants affected by the criminal justice system as a vulnerable group. The Scottish Government should introduce child impact assessments for those on custodial and non-custodial sentences. Local councils should develop a system of data sharing between early year services, parenting, family support services and local offender management. The creation of a national framework of outcomes and standards for babies affected by criminal justice to integrate maternal and infant health policy, early year services and criminal justice. Needs of infants affected by the criminal justice system should be addressed in children's service planning and planning of offender management services to coordinate these. And finally, support based on evidence should be given to parents in prison with a particular focus on promoting sensitive caregiving. In the majority of countries which allow mothers to live with their babies in prison, 
The maximum age limit is generally three years old, which is double that of the UK. Ensuring babies live with their mother whilst in prison can have a positive developmental influence. However, a recent inspection of the mother and baby unit at HMP Cornton Vale branded the unit unfit for purpose, a situation that cannot be allowed to continue. This is not the first report to look at the wider subject of children who are affected by parental imprisonment. There have been numerous reports conducted by the third sector organisations, with each focus focusing on their own specific angle and contributing to the growing body of research into this issue. Reports such as Not Seen, Not Heard, Not Guilty by the Scottish Children's Commissioner, which focused on issues with visiting and actions of the Scottish Government, the SPS and local authorities, as well as the Families Outside report, the roles of schools in supporting families affected by imprisonment, which focused on education and the impact of GERFEC. As many of you may know, I have recently lodged a private member's bill for consultation titled the Support for Children Impact of Parental Imprisonment Scotland Bill. And my bill seeks to place a statutory duty on the courts to order a child and family impact assessment yeah. after sentencing, which is after a sentencing decision has been handed down. The bill would amend the Education, Education Additional Support for Learning Act to specifically recognise children affected by parental imprisonment as one of the two groups of children, the other being looked after children, where it's presumed that that child will have additional support needs. My proposal is in line with some of the key recommendations made by the NSPCC and Bernardo's and will hopefully make a start in providing some support for this group of unseen and vulnerable children. And I would urge everyone who has an interest in this area to respond to my consultation and I hope my fellow members can support this. The report recognises there has been little focus on how best to meet the social, psychological and emotional needs of infants when their mothers or fathers are in prison. It highlights the impact of imprisonment on families, making meeting babies' needs especially challenging. However, by understanding these issues, we can provide support for parents, carers and babies at this critical time in a child's development. And in closing, Presiding Officer, can I thank the NSPCC and Bernardos for the help and support they have given me and can I also thank members across the Chamber who supported this, uh, this motion, allowing it to be debated, and I look forward to listening to contributions from across the Chamber. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, we are a little tight for time today, so can I confine people to closer to four minutes than perhaps we would normally indulge you with. Dr Richard Simpson, firstly, to be followed by Kenny McCaskill thereafter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate Mary Fee on uh, getting this motion before us in debate, and also welcome Fiona McLeod, who I've not seen speaking in the chamber, and I look forward to hearing her, her closing remarks. This is a particularly important area. The, one of the major problems that we actually face is that there are far too many children who do not achieve effective attachment. And without effective attachment, it is not possible for them to grow up into productive uh, citizens who are free from, from all sorts of problems, many of which Mary Fee has outlined. Can I begin by recommending to the Minister that she and her officials look at the recent report of the All Party Group at Westminster entitled Great Britons, looking at the first, the 1001 critical days. It actually refers to Tom McKay back when he was a minister here and the Scottish efforts to develop things in terms of earlier years, which this government, to give it its credit, have continued on a broad front. But it really needs to be focused, organised and concentrated on those where attachment risks are greatest. And in order to do that, we really have to ensure that we have, first of all, adequate data. How many infants have imprisoned parents? There are guesses around, but no one's certain. How many prisoners are parents to infants? How many female prisoners are pregnant? Who cares for infants when they are separated from their mother mothers? These are data that we actually must have. The numbers actually suggest that this, this is really very significant. The other problem, of course, is that when women go into prison, not only are they separated from their children, but their families are often highly disrupted. Remand prisoners for women have gone up by over a third since I was a minister. 
When I was a minister, I endeavoured to tackle the problem of women offenders with the McLean report. But frankly, we've made almost no progress since that time, apart from the measures which I introduced, like the Time Out Centre, uh, and also making sure that women who were fine defaulters didn't go to prison. Those figures have gone down significantly, but remand has gone up massively. The other thing that I think that we need to think about is not just the women offenders who may have children, but also the fathers. Because one of the problems is that where there are fathers involved, their disengagement from the process uh, really uh, makes a huge difference. That report to which I referred earlier on, the all-party uh, all group report, did look at the number of specialist perinatal teams across the whole of the United Kingdom. Many areas and regions which are smaller than Scotland in terms of population have up to five of these specialist teams. Scotland has one. If we're to have this with leadership, we need more of these specialist perinatal teams. Can I also recommend to the government that they look at the recent initiative uh, in, in the Forth Valley area of the potential development for what's called a butterfly PIP, to which the UK government will be contributing £100,000. This is a mechanism which actually helps parents to understand and, and the, the profile and portrait of their own child and to actually engage in attachment. And I know the Minister is actually in, very interested in this area, so I hope she will consider supporting the development of the Butterfly PIP, not just for the Forth Valley area, but for the whole of Scotland. This is where children, the parents are helped to recognise the signs in their children of needing consolation or feeding or the various other uh, body language responses that they may have. These, these are quite critical, and they are particularly critical in this group of women who, in her prison who have additional needs, such as poor mental health needs. I'll finish, presiding officer, because you asked us to be uh, confined to the time by just saying one last thing, and that is substance misuse and uh, alcohol and drugs is a big problem. I look forward to hearing from her fairly soon as to the progress on fetal alcohol syndrome, because this is another contributory factor in poor attachment. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank uh, Mary Fee for bringing this issue in particular, but for the work that she's doing uh, in general, uh, not simply on babies, but with regard to children. It was a matter and an issue in particular raised by the Minister currently off on maternity leave in the past Parliament, but it's been picked up and run with uh, by Mary Fee, and I've no doubt it will also be supported by the uh, Minister. There is something fundamentally tragic uh, in this. Sometimes, because of the nature of the offence, it cannot be avoided. Avoided. But anybody, and myself have visited, who has ever seen uh, the mother and baby unit sees the tragedy that goes with it. Equally, it is a significant issue. I always remember the statistic that I found perhaps most shocking was that more children in Scotland will suffer the imprisonment of a parent than will suffer the divorce of a parent. That, I have to say, I found considerably uh, uh, shocking. I, I didn't believe it at uh, first hearing it, but I am told that it is, in fact, the case, and there is a significant issue uh, there. We do know, not simply with regard to babies, but with regard to children, as was mentioned by Mary Fian, indeed Richard Simpson, and doubtless commented on by the Minister, the issues of the effect that it has upon a child, the work of Harry Burns and others, quite clear in terms of alienation. Uh, but the statistic that almost half of the children of women in Corton Bay will go on to be prisoners themselves is also a statistic that is shameful and indeed damning for all of us as a society. There is the issue of alienation, there's the issue of stigmatisation, there's a pressure on those children, indeed on uh, other partners and family members, all of the issues uh, that affect them. And what we always have to remember is that they have committed no offence, they have been convicted of no crime. Uh, they are guilty of absolutely nothing other than being the child or having a relationship with somebody who has offended and who themselves does have to take account of that. I do think we should look and view the glass as half full, not half empty. 
I think good work has been done. Uh, mention was made of all the external third agencies at work. I think good work is done by the faith groups in particular, not simply in particular work with children, but in terms of how we have family centres, uh, changing the whole nature and attitude of going to the prison estate. Some things cannot be dealt with and we can only mitigate because at the end of the day going to a prison is fundamentally visiting a secure institution. That cannot be changed. Uh, we also have to be realistic in what we can expect from such an institution. It cannot be a hospital, a college, a nursery, a creche, an academic institution and uh, expect to match all of those sectors in the outside world. What it does do, I think, is a remarkable job in trying to make sure that it provides as best it can for all the multiple uh, issues that need to be dealt with. The SPS, I think, have taken this on board, and as I say, along with faith groups, family centres have changed. Good work is done, not simply in terms of relationships with babies, but in other aspects that I've seen. The work that's been done in terms of literacy and reading, uh, certainly at Sochton, in terms of male prisoners interacting with their children, and that's replicated elsewhere, is something to be uh, supported. Uh, even the use of, I can't remember whether it's the Boys Brigade or the Scouts at Low Moss, to try and normalise what can never be a normal situation in going to visit a parent in prison. It's all testimony to good work that's on board. So I think there is, as others have said before me and Mary Fee herself has said, work that has to be done. The Minister, I've no doubt, will acknowledge that, as do the SPS. Progress has been made. Uh, some more information has to be found because we are in uncharted waters. Equally, my final comment, Deputy Providing Officer, is Fundamentally, we have to remember that we can mitigate, we can do as much as we can to normalise it, but at the end of the day, visiting anybody or having a child in prison is an abnormal situation. The best solution is that they don't go to the prison in the first place. Many thanks. <clears throat> and I now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is an invaluable and important report. We should be grateful to the NSPCC and Bernardo's for undertaking the work to produce it and take heed of the considered recommendations that it contains. A child's future is heavily influenced by their time in the womb and the environment that surrounds them as an infant. Young children are heavily influenced by their surroundings. It is tragic to think of babies growing up in prisons and care due to parental imprisonment. They are innocent victims and the criminal justice system should do everything possible to mitigate the harm that they experience. One of the report's most worrying findings is that there is insufficient data on the scale of needs in this area. It is unacceptable that there has been little improvement in the quality of data since a UK government review in 2007 described children of prisoners as invisible. We do know that in Scotland, tens of thousands of children and young people under the age of 18 are affected by parental imprisonment each year. The report's approximation of between 3,500 and 4,600 infants being affected by parental imprisonment a year is horrifying. It is unacceptable that estimations are necessary. This information should be collected and reported. Almost two-thirds of female prisoners and over half of male prisoners are parents. For those that are currently pregnant or antenatal, there is a body of evidence that they require a significantly higher level of medical intervention. That there are currently two further mother and baby units planned for the Scottish prison estate is a welcome development. Sadly, there is currently no mother and baby unit in Fife. This is an issue I would like to see addressed in the future. Pregnant women need flexibility in relation to their health care and other practicalities. Simply because a woman is in prison does not mean that she does not need this flexibility. Some pregnant women have committed very serious offences and need to be in prison, but we must take into account the impact that the conditions in which they are held have on their children. The problem of parental contact when a parent is in, is in prison is raised by the report. A failure to maintain regular contact with the children is a serious barrier to successful post-release reunification. Failure to successfully reunite with the child is detrimental to the well-being of not only the child, but also the parent, reducing the likelihood of rehabilitation and increasing the likelihood of recidivism. The recent development by the Scottish Prison Service of a national framework for setting standards for, parenting, for parenting in prisons is a welcome development. The reality is, however, that with downward pressure on budgets and criminal justice, the strategy outlined in the framework may exist only on paper. The support required for parents in prison and their children is costly, but clearly in line with the Scottish Government's stated strategy of preventative spending. Once an imprisoned mother gives birth to their baby, their babies are taken, often taken into care. 
This is not done lightly. The report notes that in the 12 months up to September 2013, six of the eight babies born in prison were taken into care. We must also, as in so many cases, respect kinship carers. Relatives, often grandparents, step into the breach to care for the children of imprisoned parents. Family support workers who work hard to provide as much support as possible to these carers can offer invaluable help to kinship carers. The report finds that provision to be sparse and inconsistent. Sadly, this is just one of the many ways that kinship carers are all too often let down by the system. There are some aspects of what we do in Scotland that are positive. That the NHS in Scotland is required to provide the same health care, including antenatal care, to mothers that is provided in the community is a good thing. We should welcome the fact that the two new mother and baby units are to be built here and that we do not routinely reject applications for mothers to attend them, unlike in other parts of the United Kingdom. This issue obviously affects men, but the primary focus on this issue has to be women. We should bear in mind a key finding of the caution report that women and men are different. Equal treatment of men and women does not result in equal outcomes. According to a related report from the Quakers, women are more likely to be held on demand than men. The impact that this can have, even on those who have been acquitted, is enormous. As the Quakers report outlines, she may have lost her job, her home, her place on mental health or drug rehabilitation programmes in the meantime. For children, having a mother placed in pre-trial detention has we many of the same effects close, as please. having a mother imprisoned following conviction. Um, sorry. Uh, to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm pleased that this issue has been brought to the Parliament. The report shows us that there is clearly insufficient reporting and statistical requirements. The other core recommendations contained within the report are sensible and measured. The essence of the problem is that we do not have enough information and statistics on the issue, and we do not have coordination and planning on it. Thank you. And thank you. Thanks very much. Now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking Mary Fee for bringing a very important debate to the Parliament today for there's absolutely no doubt that the impact of the imprisonment of a parent and children is an issue which at best has not been given the prominence it should have for far too long and at worst is virtually ignored. And in terms of statistics, it's um, alarming and um, concerning that today in Scotland a staggering 27,000 children each year experience uh, a parent's imprisonment. And to put this in perspective, and it's something that Kenny McCaskill referred to in his contribution, this equates to approximately twice as many children as experience a parent's divorce uh, in the same time frame. And as the motion recognises, the impact of imprisonment affects the whole family in a number of ways. For example, children are likely to move house quite frequently. This can mean changing schools, being separated from friends. Very often, multiple care arrangements have to be put in place. And this can see the family being separated and broken up and siblings um, having to live apart. Imprisonment often attracts high-profile newspaper coverage about the individual and their crime. And as teachers will testify, the trauma and deep shame uh, and sometimes bullying that these children then experience is clear to see. And this can go on to result in a deterioration in behaviour and performance in school and in the worst case scenario, may develop into mental health and physical problems. Clearly then, as the motion highlights, there are social, psychological and emotional impacts on the children as a result of a parent being imprisoned. And these are issues that are quite simply not being sufficiently addressed, which is why there is a desperate need for children and um, to have impact assessments at the point of sentencing. It's disappointing, therefore, that Dame Angelini's commission report on women's offenders didn't make a distinct recommendation on ch child impact assessments. Uh, and this was because these child assessments are included in criminal justice social work reports, but they aren't always available for every single case, which means a, a child impact assessment isn't always carried out. Nor do the criminal justice social work reports 
always include the detailed information about family circumstances or the impact on dependents. So both the NSPCC and Bernardo's are to be congratulated for the new report, An Unfair Sentence, which analyses and highlights the detrimental, uh, detrimental impact of a custodial sentence on children under two. And equally worrying is the Bernardo's report um, statistic of 65% of boys with a parent in prison will then go on to offend themselves. Presiding officer, I very much welcome Mary, the fact that Mary McPhee is seeking to address the adverse consequences of, of the impact on children of a parent being in prison with her proposed member's bill. And it's also vitally important that judges at the point of sentence do have regard to and available child impact assessments. I was very encouraged that the new cabinet secretary also recognised this point. Many thanks. And I now call on Hans Alan Malik to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank Mary Fee for bringing this National Society Prevention Cruelty to Children and Bernardo's report on the unfair sentencing all children's count to the attention of the Scottish Parliament today. It is a pleasure to give my full support to this motion. Childhood and infancy in particular are crucial stages of development in a person's life. As we now know, every year in Scotland between 3,400 to 4,600 children under the age of two have a parent in prison. Time in prison is sometimes unavoidable. However, when we need to avoid, what we need to avoid is children suffering for their parents' wrongdoing. This report by the NSPCC and Bernardo shows the need to improve improved recognition, identification, and action for vulnerable children amongst us. Additionally, further research is needed regarding the development of under threes with parents in the criminal justice system. One would hope that all children in Scotland can have healthy and happy lives. Unfortunately, some infants like to ones mentioned in the report have the dice loaded against them practically from the start of their lives. The issue surrounding women in the criminal justice system has been a concern of some time and Glasgow City Council has created the Community Justice Authority to monitor and assist local parents with providing justice services to the community and to reduce reoffending. Such organizations can provide the basis of both support and future research into the need of babies' parents in the criminal justice system. I support Mary Fee in her pursuit of the response to, to, to this issue as the report informs us of the tra tragic reality for many children are facing today. Presiding officer, I will, I will be very interested to hear from the minister what she intends to do in view of the report in today's debate as clearly there needs to be more done to protect our young in society. May I also go on to say, presiding officer, that one of the issues in this whole situation is we're talking about young children and infants who are normally camouflaged with the, the needs of society today, who are not on the radar, who are not identified readily, and what then happens is they, they go on to grow up under a great deal of challenges that face them and their families. As a result, I believe that sometimes they can be seriously disadvantaged in society, and therefore it is absolutely critical that we take all steps and measures to ensure that we do not allow them to fall into those, those traps. We as a community and a parliament have uh, a moral responsibility to ensure their safeguard. Uh, and I hope that uh, the, the government will assist Mary Fiener Bill to reach those conclusions. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. 
Thank you. Um, I too congratulate Mary Fee for securing this debate, which of course follows on from the joint meeting yesterday of the cross-party groups on children and young people and children affected by parental imprisonment. And I would of course also like to thank NSPCC <coughs> excuse me, and Bernardo's for their valuable contribution to this matter. Their report builds on earlier work, including the Corston and Angelini reports. But as other members have already highlighted, the statistics and analysis still do make stark reading with up to 4,600 children under two affected by parental imprisonment each year in Scotland, and two-thirds of female prisoners and half of male prisoners who report having children, and that these children have at least double the risk of mental health problems. They are three times more likely to be involved in antisocial or delinquent behaviour. The report highlights areas of good practice, but it sets challenges for the government, prison service, NHS and other partners. First and foremost, to recognise infants affected by criminal justice processes are a vulnerable group. Identify them, become more aware of their needs and introduce a national action plan to ensure a coordinated, multi-agency response to these. And I know Mary Fee is seeking to secure progress in a number of these action points through a Member's Bill and I commend her for that and happy to support her in that work. She might consider whether the impact should be understood even earlier on in the justice system, such as at the remand stage. Parental contact during the early years is invaluable. It's when bonds are forged, stable loving relationships are established, and parents need these opportunities to develop their skills, gain confidence and self-esteem. As Sir Harry Burns has said in a quote, unless we look after children properly, nurture them consistently, support them and their parents, who often don't know how to be parents, we will continue to fail, and we will continue to reap the consequences in terms of criminality and poor health. That's why, for those whom prison is the only appropriate disposal, I do also want to see a greater emphasis on developing parents' life skills. One in three young men in Pullman are fathers or expectant fathers. We need to equip them for that role. More peer support for the handful of women who do give birth behind bars each year. They're deprived of the shared learning opportunities other parents normally experience at that time. And perinatal health care needs to be brought up to the same standard as it is in the community. I was also pleased to see that the report highlighted the potential to extend compulsory statutory through care services, currently only afforded to those serving four years or more. This would support thousands of more parents during their release, and it would make families more resilient and improve reintegration. Of course, the best way to limit the impact of parental imprisonment is to reduce the number imprisoned in the first place. The collateral damage of sentencing policy is at the moment not measured or considered nearly enough. You know, just a third of women remanded in custody go on to receive any custodial sentence. In 2011-12, four-fifths of women serve sentences of six months or less. Thousands of children are needlessly left behind each year because their mothers and fathers are given ineffective, disruptive, short-term stints in custody. Alternatives such as community-based justice programmes and diversion from prosecution projects are often more successful in reducing reoffending. They are not soft options, but they help preserve familial links and limit the damage on dependent children. We need to identify those in need and break the cycle of intergenerational trauma. There is only one chance to get this right for each and every child. A whole family approach to the delivery of justice would not only protect the rights of children, but it would send a clear message that their needs must not be an afterthought. Many thanks. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm, after which we'll move to closing speech. Uh, from the I congratulate Mary Fee on bringing forward this important motion and welcome this report with its focus on babies and the criminal justice system, which can disrupt so disastrously uh, the relationship with a parent at a particularly crucial time uh, in the life of a young child. I say parents, but it is mothers that uh, we need to focus on, since uh, we are told in the report uh, that uh, three quarters of children stay with their mother when their father is in prison, but only 5% of children stay within the family home when the mother is in prison. So I strongly support the first recommendation about formally identifying infants affected by the criminal justice system, and I strongly support the second re recommendation about formally identifying women in prison as a specially vulnerable group. The problem is worse, however, because under the current arrangements, women tend to be incarcerated quite a long distance away from their home, so it's difficult both to maintain uh, the relationship with the mother and to rebuild it after release from prison. 
I hope um, what doesn't happen now is what uh, Margaret Mitchell and I learned when we went to the uh, Corrington Bill with the Equal Opportunities Committee five years ago or so, uh, when we were shocked to be told that loss of a visit by a child could be used as a punishment for mothers in prison. Hopefully that does not happen again. I was very influenced on this particular subject by the inquiry we did at that time for the Equal Opportunities Committee, but I have to say that I've also been very strongly influenced by the work uh, of the organisation organization called Circle, which is based in West Pilton in my constituency, but does uh, superb work uh, far further afield as well, of course, as with families in my constituency. I was pleased to see that Circle was mentioned uh, on page 35 of the report. In fact, there was uh, quite a lot of information about their families affected by imprisonment uh, service that works with women coming out of prison, but also uh, works with carers uh, of children who have a mother in prison and helps say uh, babies and children visit their mothers when they are in prison. I should say more generally that I think the use of the voluntary sector uh, in this kind of work is particularly appropriate. I think uh, this is more empowering for uh, women uh, in prison and coming out of prison, but of course sustained funding is very important uh, for that work. I know, however, uh, from uh, my uh, conversations with Circle that ideally they, like I'm sure many others in the chamber and beyond, would rather uh, than working with mothers uh, from prison, would prefer to work with mothers in a range of alternatives to prison, whether that's diversion from pros prosecution or effective community sentences or other options, but certainly they don't want to be working, for example, with all the women, that we've heard this from Richard Simpson and others uh, in remand, 70% of whom never actually receive a sentence, but of course, uh, in the meantime, uh, the relationships with the family have broken down and children have been separated from the mother. When there must be prison, then let's have local units near the family, uh, let's have family visits at times that suit the family, uh, and in fact let's have funding for poorer families if they can't uh, afford regular uh, visits. Of course, welcome uh, Mary Fee's bill, and I uh, wish her uh, all the best uh, in its progress, and uh, I hear what she says about uh, family impact assessments after sentences, and I certainly uh, couldn't disagree with that. But I suppose my last word is, ideally, I would like to see family impact assessments before sentencing, because this issue is so important. Many thanks. And I now call on the Minister Fiona MacLeod to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking Mary Fee for bringing forward this motion for discussion this afternoon and also to thank um, all the members who signed it to allow it to be uh, de uh, debated this afternoon to all those who've contributed to it. I think it's fair to say that we can start by saying that we all want Scotland to be the best place in the world for children to grow up and therefore the welfare of our children is of paramount importance. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child sets out the fundamental rights that each and every child should enjoy, irrespective of a child's family circumstances. And for me, this debate is very timely because just last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and I met with the representatives from families outside Bernardo's and NSPCC to discuss the report in more detail. And I'd like to say that that was a very positive meeting. Um, but the top line that I took out of it was what one of the researchers said. We need to work out how we identify these babies and young people without stigmatising them. And I think that's a key thing that we have to take from this. It's something that Kenny McCaskill and Margaret Mitchell have alluded to in their comments. And for me, listening to this and reading the report, I think that identifying the child's needs without stigmatising the child is absolutely embedded in our getting it right for every child approach, which we legislated to make statutory in the Children and Young People Act last, last year, because it's about all children and young people's needs, their well-being is paramount. So my question to myself when I was thinking about this was, in everything that we are doing already for our young children through GERFEC, through Children um, and Young People's Act, are we sure that everything that we're doing as a government is also recognising and giving support to this particularly vulnerable group supporting these babies? So the holistic definition of well-being means that all aspects of a child's life are considered. 
including parental and wider family circumstances. So I hope that you know, that will mean that we, we capture these babies. GERFEC is for all children, including this vulnerable group, like the babies affected by parental imprisonment and wider justice system. Now, we know that GERFEC works, and that's why we legislated for it. And one of the key points of that legislation, Children and Young People Act, I think for all children, but for this vulnerable group of babies, is going to be the named person. Because the named person will be the single point of contact from birth for children, parents and all the practitioners around those children. The named person will help to prevent any children who need extra help from slipping through the net. I think Hans Alamalik referred to that. And those children whose needs required coordinated planning, and I, these vulnerable babies will, that means that they will have to have a child's plan managed by a lead professional to help them with this. So my question was, is are we doing everything we can? And I think we're doing a lot. And I think it's about making sure that, that, that when we're doing all these named person, lead professionals, child's plans, that we always think about these vulnerable babies when we're doing it. The meeting agreed, the meeting last week agreed that I should go away and look at what's already happening and have a timeline of what we're doing. So it was incredibly interesting for me um, to, to actually go and read about all the things that we are doing to support mothers, fathers and their children when the mothers or fathers are imprisoned. And just last night, I'm sure other members were in the garden lobby um, to meet the people from the public social partnerships. Um, that's eight, funded by the £18 million Reducing Reoffending re Change Fund. The six organisations that were there last night, absolutely fascinating, and I came away with a wealth of information, as I always do. These, these, these um, organisations are providing mentoring for prisoners. They're providing mentoring for those that are um, liable to uh, offend and re-offend. And what I was most impressed about was going round every single stall and asking the question about what family support they had. And every single one talked about that was intrinsic to the work they were doing with these young men and women. Um, you know, meeting the folk from Shine, the Women's Mentoring Service, really inspirational work that they're doing. You know, I can't name them all, but it really is interesting. But can I just make one, uh, one, one particular reference? Speaking to the people from Chance to, Cha Chance to Change, and not just speaking to the people that are working with the young folk, but speaking to a young woman called Kayleigh, who wanted me to say today about how working with these people had made such a difference to her life as a young woman. So that's the sort of thing we should be looking at. And of course, Malcolm Chisholm uh, knows a lot about uh, the Circle and the work that they're doing in Pilton. Um, £75,000 from the Early Years Policy Unit as a strategic funding partner. And I know that Aileen Campbell, the minister, um, visited there on the 21st of March 2013 and was very impressed. In my reading, I find out that they're delivering triple P, mellow parenting, and for me, the book bug scheme. Um, very important to get parents working with their young babies. So lots of other um, areas that I could talk about where we are already doing work. Um, the Early Years, Early Years Change Fund, we've committed £420,000 to Bernardo's to continue the Five to Thrive project currently running in HM Prison, Perth. Um, so lots of others that I could mention, but what I would like to do is quickly pick up on a few of the points that have been made and kind of ran through what we were talking about today. We talked about data collection, Mary Fee, Richard Simpson, Jane Baxter, Malcolm Chisholm. I know that the Scottish Prison Service are looking at methods of being able to collect the information about prisoners that are parents. Currently, that's done through the, at the care screening, care screening stage, but that relies on self-reporting. So the Scottish Prison Service is looking at other ways we can do this. A lot of folk talked about women offenders and actually being in prison. And as members will know, um, since we made the decision or not to go ahead with HMP Inverclyde, the government has uh, embarked on an extensive consultation and particularly with reference to women offenders is looking at how we can have more 
um, local provision for women who have to go to prison or community provision for them. Um, I wanted to talk about the child impact assessments, if I may, presiding officer, because I think it's important to quote from Dame Ailey Angelini when she was at the Justice Committee on the 26th of June 2012, where she said, and I quote, we must move away from creating more bureaucracy, more reports, and look at what would make a difference to the sentencing process. Consideration of children should be critical to that process, but I believe that such issues should arise out of the professional's training. It should be their bread and butter. That is how social workers, defence solicitors and judges should approach the matter. And I would hope that GERFEC makes it a bread and butter issue. May I, presiding officer? The, the, point, the point I have tried to make all along in relation to child um, impact assessments, I acknowledge that in some cases they are done, but the focus is on the offender, not the child. And we need to move that focus to the child if we are ever to make a real difference. And I, I, would, I would take Mary Fee back to my opening remarks about all the provisions under the Children and Young People's Act with the named person, the child's plans. So, you know, when Dame Elish Angelini talks about it being a bread and butter, it is a bread and butter. Gerfek means it's a bread and butter. So in conclusion, presiding officer, and thank you for the extra time, um, it's clear that we all have an active role to play in delivering the support that those in our care require. And we are committed to working with both the men, the women, their families, their communities, and all our partners in order to encourage and maintain meaningful family contact throughout anybody's time in custody. Thank you. Good. And thank you, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate today. I now suspend Parliament until 2.30 this afternoon.